Chris Hensley is a registered representative of Cambridge Investment Research, Inc., a broker-dealer member of FINRA, SIPIC, investment advisor representative of Cambridge Investment Research Advisors, Inc., a registered investment advisor. Cambridge and Houston First Financial Group are not affiliated. Good afternoon, everybody. You're listening to Money Matters. I'm Chris Hensley. Uh, it, it, we have a great show lined up for you today. The COVID-19 pandemic forced an unprecedented experiment that reshaped white collar work and turned remote work into a kind of new normal. Now comes the hard part. Many employees want to continue this new normal and keep working remotely. And most at least want the ability to work occasionally from home. But for employers, the benefits of employees working from home or hybrid approaches are not so obvious. What should both groups do. We have with us today the author, Peter Capelli. Uh, uh, Peter, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Chris. And I'm going to hold up the book here, uh, The Future. This is the good thing of not using the, the green screen in the background. I can actually show the book here. Uh, the book is The Future of the Office, and this is with uh, Wharton School Press here. And I'm going to just share your, your a little bit of your bio for listeners. Uh, now, you... Um, you're the George W. Taylor Professor of Management at the Wharton School and Director of Wharton Center for Human Resources. You write a monthly column uh, on workforce issues from Human Resource Executive Online, and you're a regular contributor to the Wall Street Journal and Harvard Business Review. Um, outside of what we just mentioned on the bio there, is there something that you might be able to share with listeners so that they can get to know you a little bit better? Um, uh, I have a puppy. That's good. <laughs> Puppies are always good. <laughs> uh, yeah, we spent uh, we we've spent a lot of the pandemic outside of Philadelphia, so it's a happy place for dogs and gardens and that kind of stuff. So we've, as with a lot of other people, we've had kids return home during the pandemic. Yeah, you know, so yeah. experience shared by millions. Exactly, exactly. Well, then that that gets us right into um, the book, the the future of the office. Why did you write the future of the office? Well, I've been interested, I think, always about uh, what's actually happening in the workplace. It affects lots of people, right? It's the center of big chunk of our lives. It's not the center of lives for lots and lots of people. And you know, we're always talking about the new normal. And there's always this talk about, you know, are robots going to take our jobs? No is the answer. You know, are millennials really different? No is the answer. You know, the answer to most of these things is really no. But this issue is really a big one. And the thing about it is that you can't duck it if you're an employer, right? If you have people working from home, at the moment, it's still about 20% of uh, people are working from home, down from about 40% earlier this year, well, earlier in the pandemic period. Um, so these are big numbers, and uh, one way or the other, you have to decide what are you going to do. Uh, you can either go back, have everybody go back to work, or you can bring them, you know, let them stay home, which is what they've been doing. But one way or the other, you're going to decide you can't, you can't do nothing, right? Right. Continuing to do what you're doing is something. So I so I'm a small business owner and with my financial planning practice the last year I was basically operating remotely from my house uh, both me and my assistant uh, this has made me make a decision to to actually I guess kind of a hybrid model where we're we're closing the physical office here we're opening a smaller one near my house but my assistant is actually in Friendswood which is several geographically not that close to Houston. So it's given us some opportunity there. But as a small business owner, um, you know, I have these decisions to make. And when reading through the book, this is not just, you know, th these are major companies that are going through this transition and making these decisions. Right. Uh, you, right. you Tell us about that, some of the bigger companies that are having to face this as well. You know, the important and maybe interesting thing about this is that companies are all going in different directions. So if you look at the New York City banks and the investment companies, they're more or less saying, everybody come on back. Uh, if you look at the tech companies, um, they're sort of saying, um, you know, you could go work remotely. The caveat that we're often not listening to is they're also saying, we're going to cut your pay if you work remotely, uh, which sometimes we're not 
paying attention to. And so I'm beginning to wonder whether they're really serious about wanting people to work remotely and, you know, would you really want to do it? But I think one of the things that's so novel about this is that companies are all over the place about this. Mm -hmm. But, you know, maybe the most interesting example right now has been Google, which mm -hmm. is the company probably most famous for the idea of getting everybody to work, getting everybody in the office, keeping them there with all these wonderful perks, paying you a subsidy if you'll move close to the headquarters so you can be there a lot. You know, you can get free haircuts or, reduce, you know, they'll take your dry cleaning, they'll walk your dog, you know, I mean, you name it, they will do it for you. And they just decided last month that 20% of their employees could just go away, go live anywhere you want, work anywhere you want. Another 20% could go anywhere they want as long as they could get to a Google office at some point, I guess. The remaining 60% could take a month, a year, and work anywhere in the world they want. And they could work outside the office for, I think, it's two days a week or something like that. So having moved from dominant position of you've got to be in the office to, well, why don't you go away, is a pretty profound move. And so one has to ask themselves, well, why did this change? Were they wrong that being in the office all the time was really important and useful? Is this a better way? Or do they feel they've got no choice for some reason? So, you know, that in a nutshell is kind of showing what is so important, but also really, really unusual about this moment. Absolutely. And now I know if you kind of look at the pros and cons, not just from the employer side, but also from the employee side, can you share some of those things with us as well? Yeah. So one of the things that makes this difficult is that we don't really know what happened to people during the pandemic. We know that people were really grateful about having the ability to work from home. And some of that's because they would have lost their jobs otherwise. And some of it, particularly for parents, could not have worked because their kids were not in school. And so the kids were going to be home alone and childcare issues were a nightmare. So people were really grateful about that. Uh, there was a pulling together in many companies that were trying to keep the businesses going. They were trying to provide essential products and services. Um, it's not clear that that's all going to continue, right? And the big thing that will not continue is during the pandemic, we were all in this together. Afterwards, once we start giving people choices, we're not. Uh, you can decide, are you gonna be one of the people in the office? Are you gonna be one of the people outside the office? And we actually know a fair bit about this because we've studied telework for about 20 years. And the people who were out of the office, at least in previous studies, they didn't do so well. Their careers tended to stagnate. They didn't get promoted as quickly. They got lower pay increases. They were less committed to the organization and less engaged. Uh, you know, it just re really was not a pretty picture for people who work remotely. It may have been worth it to pay that price on their career in order to be home. But uh, it's, you know, you ought to go with your eyes open if you're a person raising your hand saying, I want to do this. You know, and for the employers, it's also quite tricky. If you're working permanently remote, that's pretty simple. What the savings is going to be, we're going to take your office away and we might cut your pay too, right? But for everything else, it's not so clear how it helps the employer. And I think that's important to think out. We can easily understand why it's going to be difficult for the employer, figuring out why it helps them, not so clear, right? So there's all kinds of implications for this choice. Of course, it depends on who you are, what industry you're in, what kind of work people do, but the impacts on the people and the company are not the same. What works for one group doesn't necessarily help the other. So getting your hands around this whole thing is really pretty hard. So I'm 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 listening. I'm taking notes here because this is really important. Some of the stuff you shared with us, uh, and we knew when COVID hit the childcare issues and how it had helped avoid layoffs. Uh, but it may in that we were all in it together. But that it may it's going to look different after after this point. Uh, you right. talked about you know having the research of 20 years of teleservices to kind of project or get some idea of what what you know people's state of mind who have worked outside of the physical office there has been and how it's affected their careers uh, but then also from the employer side how does it help rather than just be a challenge uh, does it help you know these are all the issues that have come up here um, 
What about the impact of working in an office environment versus a remote environment uh, on the local, the global economy, even you know, residential or commercial real estate? What can you tell us about that? Yeah, so we had a little uh, conference uh, about this here. The Federal Reserve Board ran it um, in Philadelphia this last week, and so we were kicking these uh, arrangements uh, around and, and what might be happening. So just as my personal read is that offices are not, at least so far, in as bad shape as we would have thought. Uh, commercial real estate per se is sort of doing okay. Uh, Office space in the worst situation, as opposed to lab space and manufacturing and other sorts of things, you know. Um, but, um, you know, offices aren't doing as bad as we would have thought. On the other hand, um, you know, there are places where it's going to be bad. If you cut out, for example, you work at home just one day out of five. And that means one day out of five, you're not having lunch in the city or at the in your office or whatever. 20% cut in lunch business, that's not trivial. And, you know, the other thing is many of us do our errands around work, the places we, you know, we work, we take our dry cleaning in, we drop our shoes off, you know, see our doctors there. If we don't go to those places as often, maybe it's easier for us to shift where we do those things, you know. Personally, I don't think cities are in such bad shape on this because many people want to live in cities anyway. So it's not like they are there simply because of their job. It seems to me the places that are in some trouble are these kind of edge communities, mm -hmm. um, you know, places like, um, you know, every big city has a beltway and around that beltway, lots of corporate office parks popped up and things. And, you know, those places, if you start cutting office space there, what are you gonna do? I mean, why is there a reason to be there? Um, you know, you don't wanna live there, you're not going to work there. What happens to those places? And that's, it seems to me, a little trickier. But it is a big question. I mean, I think what we have learned so far is it's it's not probably going to be that we're falling off the edge of a cliff with this office space going down. Um, but, you know, these marginal changes, even if they're not huge, over time start to reshape cities and start to reshape locations. So that's that's a lot just from, you know, the idea uh, how it could affect, you know, the the I'd say more rural, but the the um, sub, suburbs around the, the large hub cities. Uh, that is a lot to consider there. I, I mean, even you talked about lunch business. If you take a, just a single day off, you multiply that by how many people are doing that. And you see retail and the, the local restaurants, um, you know, suffering. Uh, are, are, are a loss in business. So that's that's huge uh, for, for that. Uh, you know, one of the I'm going to I'm going to pivot just a little bit now and talk about um, one of the things you said earlier was that when they offered the remote position, cutting your pay. Uh, and so that right away, you know, a uh, uh, red flag went up. If I was an employee, I'd say, wait a second. <laughs> uh, is that, part, you know, part of this? Is that part of what, what we're doing here? So let's look at it from both the employer and the employees. Uh, what leverage do either of us have when negotiating what the future of professional office looks like? Well, you know, employers have had most of the marbles in this game for the last, you know, 40 years or so. You know, the power of employees has declined. It hasn't been a great labor market for most of this period for job seekers. Union power is gone effectively, right? And legislation at the state and some city levels has been sort of aggressive, but across the country as a whole, not so much. So the employers are largely calling the shots. Um, the constraint on this is really around hiring. And, you know, one of the things that employers believe is that if they can have remote workers, they could hire anywhere. And that's probably true. That expands the number of people, the size of the labor market they could tap. That would seem like it might help them. And of course, they could actually go overseas as well. You know, nothing prevents you from having an employee who is working outside the US, you don't need a visa for those people. They're governed by the laws in the country where they are doing their work, not by the country that owns the headquarters. But the other side of this is that 
your employees could be hired by anybody as well uh, around the world, right? Uh, assuming that that happens. So, you know, will this help employers or or hurt them? You know, I think the employers heading in this direction believe it will help them. And I think they're also feel this opportunity to grab something back from employees. You know, there's no sensible reason why employers need to cut the pay of people working remotely. And, you know, the wages of those folks are not based on cost of living. You know, Silicon Valley in particular is not, does not pay high wages because it's an expensive place to live. It's an expensive place to live because those people demand high wages, right? The labor market for high-skilled computer programmers, you know, Silicon Valley wants the very best people. You're not gonna find those, if you move to Lake Tahoe, let's say, or out to um, the Grand Tetons, you know, there's no labor market in the Grand Tetons for really high-end computer programmers, just not there. So when the companies are saying, you know, we're gonna pay you based on the local labor market, there is no local labor market for that stuff, right? So it is simply a way of grabbing some money back from employees. And I think it's a way of making the investor community happy by being able to say, okay, the employees are getting something out of this. What are we getting? Saving on office space would sound like it's enough, but in addition to that, you know, they're going to try to grab something else from employees. You know, maybe they can do it. What I'm hearing from people is that. Uh, a lot of employees are starting to second guess this because the employers are wanting a pretty big cut out of your pay. You know, 10% sounds reasonably common and some are wanting more than that in order to give you the privilege of moving. Wow. That that would make me look twice for sure. <laughs> uh, yeah. you, you know, you mentioned uh, the idea of hiring uh looking different and, and that's kind of what i saw is that you know hey our my first my first impression was the talent pool is bigger you can you know i'm not bound by ge geography to where i can uh pull from but then the second part that you just mentioned is that there is now a competitive environment where as a small business owner there may be a bigger company that can take my employees away and offer them more um and so this is a new thing that we need to to be aware of from the employer side from the employee side the fact that they're trying to slip a pay cut of about 10 percent for this perk that's something we need to be aware of as well and as um uh, as, as business owners, you know, taking care of your employees needs to be something of a, of a huge concern. Um, Chris, well, I said that one, one more two on the part of employees to be concerned about, and that no. is, you know, if you are a permanently remote worker, so you never have to come into the office, I think at some point somebody is going to ask, why are you an employee at all? Why aren't you an independent contractor? Why are we keeping these people as employees and paying the payroll taxes and all these benefits? Let's just move them into independent contractor status and we'll save even more money on this. So I, I would be prepared for that move mm -hmm. as well if you are somebody opting for this permanent remote. By the way, not as many people seem to want to do this as we would think if you listen to the news. So there was a McKinsey sponsored survey uh, about two months ago now, I don't think it's changed much. And it was about 8% of employees wanted to do that. So it wasn't everybody. Um, and 37% wanted to go back to the office more or less the way we've been operating. There was a majority that wanted more flexibility. And when we say hybrid, this is what they mean. But you know, hybrid can mean anything. It's everything except staying back, coming completely back to the office and going completely uh, home, staying completely home, right? So everything in between is is hybrid. So somebody says we're going to do hybrid, that doesn't tell you very much, right? That's true. That's uh, that, it could really mean anything at this point. So very true, yes, very sir. true. So some of the things you just mentioned is the danger of become of that 1099 or that independent contractor status is you know if they're able to save money here why not take the health benefits and that kind of stuff and then and we see you know that argument with the independent contractors stuff in California with the Uber and all of the uh, um, uh, work on demand type positions. This has been a kind of a crazy area to go down that road for, you know, so it's not necessarily something everybody wants to go down or either the employer or the employee. Um, 
because we've seen some volatility in that area as well. Uh, one of the things I did want to touch upon a little bit more is we were saying that, you know, the hybrid uh, model is hard to kind of pin down what it is. What are some of the challenges that are likely to arise from the companies that are doing kind of a hybrid where it's not 100% stay at home and it's not 100% in the office? Uh, what are some of those challenges that we need to be aware of? Yeah, so uh, there I think the issue of fairness becomes really big. So um, why is it that you can work from home and I can't? And we say, well, it's because of your job. Well, that doesn't seem fair. Uh, Chris gets to work from home. Okay, you're telling me I can't, so what are you gonna do for me? And you know, related question from people who are working from home is, you have all these nice perks for people in the office. I'm working from home, I don't get any of them. How is that fair, right? I think the management challenges are big ones. If I'm a supervisor and I've gotta manage some employees who are remote, that's a big challenge. But if I've got employees in the office as well, they're a different group. I gotta manage them differently. Can I manage these two different groups of employees well and differently at the same time? Well, that's a lot to ask of supervisors, given that we've been squeezing them so much in any case. And frankly, supervision has not been going particularly well over the last generation or so already. Now we're throwing a big new challenge at them. It's going to be hard to pull off. Absolutely. So that is that is a lot of things that we I haven't personally looked at, and I'm sure a lot of people haven't thought it thought it out that far uh, when it comes to how this is going to affect us. One of the things you write about is the potential for failure that lies in remote having heavy working arrangements. Expand on that. Tell us more about that. Uh, the potential for failure in remote, uh, can you just say it again? I didn't quite hear. Uh, it, it, in remote heavy working arrangements. So let's see, I think uh, if you are the remote worker uh, and you are really far away and you don't see your colleagues very often, uh, it is easy to make mistakes. And the mistakes, it, particularly if you don't get help from your supervisor, is that you didn't, you weren't able to read the tea leaves suggesting that the direction you were going in this project was not gonna be supported by some of the other stakeholders. I'm working on a team uh, with other people and they're also remote and it's way easier for us to get into conflicts because we don't have those kind of informal ways to sort things out and a lot of the conversation is by email where things get snippy. And, you know, it's just harder to, to make that work uh, if we are remote. We can't have agile like project management, which is kind of constant feedback, constant on the, uh, you know, in-person conversations with each other when people are working from home. And, you know, nobody wants to sit in front of their computer all day with your home. That's part of the beauty of not being in the office, right? right. So, you know, just getting things done the kind of task we did before when everybody is remote is, is tricky. One we didn't mention before is that, you know, this all seemed to go pretty well for people who were already employees during the pandemic, right? right. But uh, they knew everybody, they knew the rules, they've been around a little bit. But how about those people who are just hired? So right. I have colleagues who I've never met yet. They were hired a year ago or a year and a half ago and I've never seen them and they're just now able to come back to the office. If you're one of those new hires in an organization where you've never even been in the building, let alone met a lot of the employees there, you know, it's pretty tough. It's it, this is it's a complete new form of communication. I mean, I, I'm somebody that interpersonal, the body language, you know, I do a lot of public speaking. I work with uh, teachers and professors who prior to this were used to lecturing and that sort of stuff. And there's so much uh, nonverbal cues that we get. Um, and so this is this this uh, digital communication makes it harder for the team. The thing you mentioned earlier about stakeholders and kind of getting a feel real time feedback. It's much harder when there's a delay there. All of these things are, are really super important. And then you mentioned just now about um, hiring and people who are new to the company and you call so you say something onboarding 2.0. Tell us about that. What is that about? Well, I think uh, if you're in this situation where you're hiring people, 
uh, and they're coming into your organization, they haven't worked there before, uh, and you're going to be doing a lot of remote work, even if that person you're hiring is not going to be permanently remote, their opportunities for bumping into other people drop dramatically if the other people are working remotely. Even if they're only working um, two days a week remote, you know, it just cuts the number of interactions that you can have down by a lot. So we need to think about how to bring these people into the organization, help them understand what the culture is in that place, what the norms are and the values, who the powerful people are, you know, all that kind of stuff, uh, because they're not going to be able to pick it up simply from being in the office the way most people have done, you know, historically. I think there's also something about onboarding in the pandemic, which is maybe a little novel, and that is, you know, we're bringing people back into the office after a long period of time not being there. And if you wanted to change anything about the way an organization worked, this is the time to do it because people are already shaken out of their routine a little bit. So before you bring them all back in, let's see if there's important things we want people to do differently and institute those changes before they come back. It's easier to step into something different if you're already shaken out of your routine a little bit. I can almost guarantee you that after a few days back in the office, people are going to just comfortably slip back into whatever they were doing before. Everything's familiar. Everything looks the same. So if you want to change anything about the way the place works, more interaction, more cooperation, whatever it is, try to do it now before you bring those people back when you've got this window of change. I love it. I love it. This opportunity, this window of change to kind of reset uh, when people are coming back on that onboarding 2.0. Uh, Peter, we are right here bumping towards the end of the half hour. The book, The Future of the Office. Let me see, make sure I can get it on the screen here. Um, now, for people who want to get a copy of the book, where would you point them to? Um, Amazon's easy. <laughs> Amazon seems to be... Uh, actually you have the best price too. So for your folks and your show, you're interested in that. So <laughs> tell them that's the place to get a deal. <laughs> Absolutely. And if they just want to find out more information about you, they can go to the uh, Wharton uh, uh, website and then just do a search and pull up your, your information as well. Yeah, uh, this is the beauty of having a last name like Capelli. There's not 20 other <laughs> Capellis. I I'm love it. It's pretty easy. I love it. Well, we're right here at the end of the show. What have I forgot to ask you that you'd love to share with the listeners? Uh, well, I think, I don't know that we haven't covered it already, but, you know, just the, the fact that this is such a big deal and that stumbling into your decisions is just not a smart thing to do. You know, let's just not worry about it. Never a good response. Never a good plan. But can we think? Never a good plan. Uh, let's see if we could think through each of these issues before we actually start making decisions. And, and I think also um, letting people know that you are experimenting. This is the first time we're thinking about this. We're not sure we're going to keep it, right? Because once you give people some sort of right or privilege, it's really hard to take it away. So being able to present this as an experiment, we're figuring things out as we go. We probably will have to change some things along the way. Managing people's expectations up front is a big deal. I love it. Well, let's leave it right there. That is a good thought to leave it on. Peter, thank you so much for joining us. Have a good rest of the day there. Good. Thank you. And thanks. Thank your folks. Absolutely.